Hello, my name is Jambariki, and joining me for an interview is voice actress Susan Sheridan, whose roles have included Noddy in Noddy in Toyland, Moomin in The Moomins, Trillian in the radio series adaptation of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and Princess Alonwe in The Black Cauldron. Thank you very much for joining me, Susan. Hi, it's a pleasure. <laughs> I'd like to start at the beginning. Uh, could you tell me what your childhood was like? And my childhood was wonderful. Um, brought up in the home counties, um, a very nice uh, sort of devoted book reading family. So I was brought up on good books and um, the ballet and going to the theatre when we could afford it. So I was kind of steeped in an understanding of um, creative work, let's say. Uh, although I went through a school system that was fairly basic and, you know, ordinary. Um, but I was, I guess, brought up in a family of, of people who understood the creative side of, of, the, of, of life. Brought, I was brought up in a family of book lovers and ballet lovers and theatre lovers. So we, knew, we, we were able to indulge in things creative, let's say. Um, a fairly creative family. So it sort of seemed natural for me to go into the acting world. And when I did, I kind of knew, you know, I knew, I knew it was the right thing to do and I understood the world of creativeness, <laughs> as it were. What was school like for you? Um, school was boring and I, I never really uh, enjoyed it that much but you know school was school and I learned a few things and I managed to get through it all I wanted to do was get on stage really so it would have been uh, it was kind of it was kind of dull because I, all I wanted to do was act uh, when did you first take an interest in acting like officially what point did you realize I want to be an actress well as I say I was interested you know right through my all my childhood really uh, but uh, when I was um, 18 I, I left school and went to drama school and I went full I went to the Guildhall School of Music and Drama full time and did my you know two years of drama and it was the happiest I think I'd ever been because I knew I was in the right place at the right time. What was your first role in a film or a television series or special? Do you mean professional? Yes. Or do you, at drama school? Professionally, I went straight into the theatre. I went straight into rep, as it was known then. Um, we had weekly rep. In, can you imagine? We did weekly rep, putting on a play in, in a week. Unbelievable. Um, I did that for a couple of months, and then I went into fortnightly rep, which was superior, and uh, stayed there for about a year. Um, and then I started to sort of move around the country, going from theatre to theatre, doing random plays, random jobs. But then I did get into uh, radio, and doing radio uh, propelled me into this finding out that I could do children's voices. And so that's how I started doing children's voices on, on radio. But I, I would say that the plays that I'd done on stage and the the, the play, the performances that I enjoyed most were usually comedy roles um, uh, and certainly I always enjoyed playing principal girl and things like that. So, you know, there was a lot of fun to be had in playing, uh, uh, playing in comedy. Now, you played Moomin in the anime adaption of the Finnish comic series The Moomins. Did you read any of Tove Janssen's comics in preparation for this role? Uh, I hadn't read the books. No, I hadn't read the books of the Moomins because they just weren't part of my upbringing, I suppose. But once I did, once I got the offer of doing the voices, I had to read them. And I must say, they're amazing, wonderful stories. And it had a, quite an effect on me. Um, I, when, when I was recording the Moomins. I loved it so much. I said to my husband, I, I don't want to live in a town anymore, I want to live in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And so we did. We moved out. We moved out to uh, the house in Burnham Beaches, uh, which we actually were not in anymore. We're back in a town, but it's very nice. But um, I loved it, and I think that she was the most amazing, uh, imaginative, uh, soulful writer because every story has its compassion and a real understanding of. Uh, of, uh, of the human being, uh, the human spirit, oddly enough, since they're not humans, they're sort of quasi Um But she has a real feeling for life. You have also provided the voice of Noddy, an iconic children's character. How did you end up receiving this role? Oh, well, I just auditioned for it, like lots and lots of other people. But you know what? They had never had... Um, an actor playing the part of Noddy. They'd only had narrators. They'd had uh, Bernard Cribbins. They'd had Richard Briers, um, always narrating and just sort of putting on a little voice. Well, this was the first time they were actually using actors to play the parts. And so I auditioned and amazingly, I got the part and I was chosen by Enid Blyton's daughter. Ah. She was the one who had the final say, and she uh, wrote to the um, production company, uh, Cosgrove Hall, and they said, uh, she is the voice of Noddy. <laughs> <laughs> so I was very lucky. I was very lucky that I, you know, I was there at the right time, got the part, um, and absolutely loved it. Because I don't know if you know that we do all the parts, Jimmy Hibbert and I play all the parts on... Um, on this series, he's um, he played all the male parts and I played the female parts, but also the children characters like like um, Noddy and um, uh, Clockwork Mouse characters like that. Now you were the original voice of Trillian in the radio sci-fi drama The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. As a voice actress, what would you say are the main differences between working in radio and working in animation? I think the main difference is the time, to be honest. You, you have a lot of... Well, actually, in the old days, you did have a lot of time in radio. You could re record and rehearse. In doing animation, it's very quick. I mean, you have to be on the ball. You have to know the voice that you're going to produce uh, immediately and do it with only seconds to spare. It's a much more expensive business, obviously, you know, much better paid. But uh, the, the factor is that you have to be completely prepared to give any accent. For instance, they'd suddenly say, OK, we've got the, um, uh, the Mrs. Noah, for instance. Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Noah come, come up in one script. And you don't get the scripts in advance. You get them on the day. Oh, Mr. and Mrs. Noah, OK. Oh, let's play them Irish. So suddenly we're doing an Irish accent, you see, and so you never know quite what's going to come up in front of you. So, so that's why you have to be prepared with um, a knowledge of accents and types of voices. And, and also the ability to see, this is one of the things I said in my interview on YouTube, one of the important things about an animator, an animator voice uh, is that you must be able to put a voice to an inanimate object. So I say to people, practice by looking at, let's say, a, a, a mouse or a, or, a, or a mug or a telephone and putting a voice to it. See if you can make that come alive with a voice. And that's a very good way of um, preparing yourself for what might come if you get into doing a, a, a cartoon series. Your most well-known voice acting role was for Princess Alonwe in The Black Cauldron. What was it like working for a major animation company like Disney? It was fantastic. It was an absolute joy because I was uh, employed over a period of three years. I had to keep going back to record and then they'd put the animation to the voice because that's the way around they do it. And so for three years I went every spring, uh, I think I went twice a year, and you can imagine, it was absolute heaven. Working in the Walt Disney Studios was an absolute joy. And the people were fabulous to work for. However, the film itself, which cost millions and millions of dollars, was one of the most expensive cartoons they'd ever made, uh, was not um, the major success that they expected it to be. 
which I think is very sad. And one of the reasons is I think it's a very dark film. And it didn't have enough light, a lot of shade, but not enough light. And I kept saying when we were doing it, look, couldn't we have a song? I'm a singer, Nigel Hawthorne could sing, and he played a character who was a bard, Fluda, the Fl Fluda Flam, the bard. So we should have had a song or two, and they didn't take, take me up, they didn't do it, and that's a great shame, because there would have been then more moments of lightness. And John Hurt, who played the whole thing, you know, fantastic, but terribly scary. My uh, neighbours, I went to the premiere with various children, my neighbours' children, and she, the mother said, my God, she said, we'll never sleep at night. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it, it is a scary film. I mean, now it's become a sort of cult thing, and, you know, I think children are much more used to scariness and darkness. But then in the, what was it, the 80s, it was... It was uh, it was very dark, and I I I I regretted that they didn't make it um, more fun. Now you've provided roles for many anime dubs. Can you explain the difficulty behind dubbing foreign language films or series? Yes, it's completely different because you are simply uh, you 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 listen to the original line and then you put in the English version. Say you're dubbing French or Japanese, often I would do Japanese anime, and you are given the line. It depends which studio you're in. Some studios do it with a line underneath, so you just follow the line, and, and when the bar comes, you speak. When the bar stops, you stop speaking, and you have to kind of match the sound as much as possible to the, to the character. Or it's done with... Um, just beeps, so you get three beeps and you speak and you say the line and you've got a script in front of you um, and you do each line that way. So that's a much more kind of mechanical way of doing it. The joy of Disney and the joy of doing N Noddy was that, actually no, Noddy we had, we had, um, I can't remember now, <laughs> but certainly with the Walt Disney film we had the joy of doing the voices exactly as we wanted or the director wanted us to do, and then they did the animation to us. Um, and of course Cosgrove Hall now lo no longer exists, and Mark Hall actually died last year, which is very sad, mm. sad lot. Because he, you know, they were devoted in the studio uh, at Cosgrove Hall to the care and devotion of making these puppets that were about, let's say, a foot tall or whatever that is in your movies. And they were really beautiful and moved, you know, moved or stop, stop frame animation, you know, where you move, each finger can move. And, um, and that's a thing of beauty and great care. And the, my feeling is that the animation done nowadays doesn't have the same care and attention. And I found that rather sad. But anyway, that's another issue. <laughs> Apologies to my listeners for that disruptive distortion in Susan's voice. Now, Susan, what do you expect from a voice director when you work with him or her? To know the story, to know what he wants, and if he doesn't know what he wants, to be honest about it and say, you know, give me some ideas of, of what, what you think would work. But usually they come with their own ideas. But certainly to know the, the original work, to know the book, is really important. And to have a bit of humour. <laughs> now, many of your characters are actually children. How have you achieved this range of voice at times? Uh, well, it's exactly what I, as I said, you know, I found I could do children on radio. And it was, mis it was just by chance I found uh, that I could do it. And the, the funny thing was that when I auditioned for I Long We, I actually auditioned for because um, I was playing mostly boys at the time, I was I auditioned for um, Taran, the boy. But then they asked me to read for I Long Me, and I got the part, the part of I Long Me. But actually, it was Taran I I went for, um, because I was known as you know the woman who did little boys' voices on radio, and um, and in cartoons I'd done 
What have I done? I've done the Bean the Beano video. So I've done um uh what's the boy's name in there? Dennis the Menace. Dennis the Menace, thank you. I've done the video of Dennis the Menace. You know, it's all a bit rough, it's all a bit like that. And uh and I was kind of known for playing those sort of parts, so it was a shock and a delight to find I was starting to get princess parts, like, I love the voice beautiful. But in fact, you know, when they cast me, um, they didn't realise I was an adult. I mean, I was 32, I think, when I played Diamond. And, uh, and they, uh, they were arranging for a chaperone and everything for me. And then, and, and so we had to, even, you know, ring them and say, no, actually, Susan is an adult. <laughs> she, just, uh, she just did a good audition. So that was quite strange. What would you say is the key to voice acting? A, a variety. Being able to be versatile. But also being able to hold your breath in. Because one of the most important things is not to hear the breath. Not to hear the mouth movements. Not to hear the sort of lip movements that you just I just made one. And so you really have to have the clearest possible voice. And that's something you can work on. People can work on achieving that by being careful not to breathe. And especially if you're playing children, you see, you have to picture a child with a very small body frame, small lungs, smaller than adult lungs. And so they can't take the amount of breath that an adult can take. So you are slightly reduced in your breathing to this kind of slightly higher level of voice. If you can hear the difference on this, I don't know if you can. But, you know, you use just part of your lung um, capability. And that's, that's the trick for certainly for playing uh, children. And then, you know, certainly for any other radio work, any voiceover work, clarity is really important. What would you say is the hardest thing about voice acting? The hardest thing about voice acting, well, I think it's the fact that you have to control, you have to use control so much. Uh, and you have to be very alert and very with it to be able to, as I said earlier, create voices for characters that you don't know exist yet. So you suddenly have to be imaginative. I mean, that might be changing now. You might, you know, not that might not be the case. But certainly, I think you have to go into a studio prepared to do the voice of anything. And that can be, that can be hard. That can be hard, and you've got to have confidence in your own talent. <laughs> now, you also give voice coaching. How do you give lessons in voicing? Like, what kind of things do you go through? I make sure that the person I'm coaching can, first of all, breathing is terribly important, and that's, to breathe fully. Secondly, um, being aware of how the everything works because we're not really aware of how the breath works and how it activates all the jaw, the mouth, the voice, the, the, the vocal cords, the sort of soft palate, hard palate, all the parts of the face that make sound um, have to be worked. And your body works them automatically because you've learned to speak. But you have to know how it works in order to repair anything that's going wrong. For instance, a lot of people have tension and their shoulders rise up. Well, I show them how to reduce the tension, how to relax the shoulders, and how to speak through any problems that you might have so that people end up speaking confidential, con co with confidence. So that uh, confidence is really the main aspect of my teaching and on my dvd i put i've made a dvd of actually it's not a dvd it's a cd what am i saying it's a cd of the books that i wrote um, because i was i kept being asked for a book so i wrote a book and actually spread it into two mini books and then i recorded it so people can hear the exercises they can hear what i'm trying to tell them about using the voice and then they, the the actual exercises are done so the um, the listener can hear 
Now, what's your opinion of the current state of British animation? Well, um, to be honest, I don't watch it, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't, you'll have to tell me that one. I don't know. I'm, I'm really not part of it so much now. Oh, I would like to be, of course. Um, the last animated film I saw was Howl's Moving Castle, because last year I did it on stage. Uh, live on stage again. I seem to be doing a lot of things live on stage that started off life uh, in voice. Anyway, this was um, uh, a, a, a stage version, and I played Sophie Hatter uh, as as the old woman, not as the young the young woman. Um, and uh, I, so I saw I saw the film, and I thought it was all right. I didn't think it was brilliant, to be honest. I didn't think. Um, I don't think the animation is as good nowadays as it was. I know that they use CGI and I, oh God, I'm talking through my hat because I love Toy Story and I love um, Monsters, Inc. and those, but they're not English. They're American where there's enormous amounts of money. I went over to Canada to record uh, a song for Noddy. And it was incredible, the amount of, of money they were able to put into it, the quality of the music, the quality of the writing, the quality of the orchestra, the whole thing was beautifully done, per perfect. And um, I remember thinking, why can't we emulate that here? I think it's money. I think we just haven't got the funding. Do you have any favourite voice actors that influence your performances? Gosh, uh, mm, I used to have, yes. I mean, I was a great um, fan of the woman who's just died last week, Daphne Oxenford, who did Listen with Mother. Now, that was one of my, you know, great things was listening to the radio when I was a child. And then you've got people like uh, Mary Wimbush. These were great voices on radio. But the world has changed so much, you expect to have different talents. I'm, I'm impressed with Tom Hanks doing um, Woody. He's, he's wonderful. He's absolutely wonderful. Oh, and I must tell you a little story is that Miriam Margulies, who is a fantastic voice artist and a fantastic actress in general, she got me into doing voiceovers because uh, she she was kept being asked to do children, and she said, no, I don't want to do children, but I know someone who can. Uh, and she put me on to, um, she got me into her agency, and that was it. I was, um, I was, I was away. So, and yes, I admire her enormously. What advice would you give to someone who is interested in voice acting? I would say, hone all your skills and get yourself recorded. That's the most important thing. Get yourself on to tape, as we call it, and then listen back and reduce it, tighten it up, whatever, with as many accents as you can in such in a short time. Um, and and send it to as many agents as possible. There are so many voice agents. In my early days, there were only one or two voice agents. There are now hundreds of them. So. That's the thing to do, is to get a voice tape made. And in fact, I did exactly that. Even though I was experienced in radio, I, I made a voice tape with my the best things I could do on and sent it out to... Um, I didn't send it to age. I didn't need to, but I had to. You have to have a voice tape. They have to send one out. So, so I would suggest anybody interested in doing voiceovers gets that first thing out of the way. You can always improve on it too. You can always add bits. You can change it. It doesn't, you know, you don't have to use the same one all your life. You can modify it. So I think just get yourself some pieces together and and do the voices. Even if they're ones, you know, ones that are known, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Or you can make them up, you know, write them yourself. Has voicing all these iconic animated roles affected your life up to now in any way? Oh, well, I, I told you about the Moomin, doing the Moomins and how I had to live in the country. <laughs> um, and um, 
doing, oh, well, of course, I long read changed my life because it was suddenly, um, I, you know, I was, I became a bit, a bit well known. I'm not well known now, except by lovely people like you who love animated cartoons. And, um, and of course, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. This is the wonderful thing that I'm doing next autumn from uh, uh, September through to the end of November, a tour of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So uh, yes, I'd say that doing the voice of Trillian back in 1980 something, 82 I think it was, that changed my life in a big way because I've gone through my life always doing the voice of Trillian, except on television. And here we are now doing a live version of it with the original cast. So yes, I'm very grateful to voice. <laughs> what has been your favorite animated character that you've ever voiced? I have to say Noddy. I loved it. I loved doing Noddy because he's so pathetic and so indignant all the time. And so, you know, he's always like that, always very, very cross. And I think it was fun to make that sort of uh, slightly whingy character to give him some life, to put, bring him to life. It was, it was, that was enormous fun. I suppose the greatest challenge was uh, Sly the, the, in that, you know, Sly and Gobbo. And I was Sly and talk like that. And that was very grating on the voice. Um, and Let's think. I suppose there must have been others that nobody was a challenge as much as um, as those in, in, in Noddy, I don't think. They were all much easier. And um, Moomin, of course, I had to do an American. The, car, the rest of the cast were all American. Or Canadian. Do you want to return to voice acting sometime soon? Oh, well, I like to think that I've never, never moved out of it. It's only that it's moved away from me by simply by the fact, obviously, they use younger people now to do the parts. And you know, the Noddy that's going out at the moment is, uh, is uh, voiced by a boy. And that's the other thing. They use children much, much more nowadays than they ever did before. And you know, children are very talented. They, there's some very, very fine child actors. I hate to admit it, but, <laughs> but there are, and uh, you know, if you can get a good child actor to play, to play a part, then then that's marvelous. They're cheaper, <laughs> but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, you know, dismiss it forever. I think that doing voice voice work is a fantastic part of the acting career. It's very specialized, very difficult to get into. But once you are in, it's absolutely fantastic. What else have you achieved in your life so far, as well as voice acting? Three children. <laughs> uh, written my books, done my CD. I give talks. I give talks on the Elizabethan dramatists. Because I did a I did a master's degree in Elizabethan drama and Shakespeare, so I'm very interested in all of that and. Um, and still being alive, really. <laughs> well, Susan, thank you for taking the time to do this interview with me. A pleasure, a pleasure. And as I say, when uh, we come to Sheffield, I'll, e I'll email you the dates and um, see how you're getting on at university. Mm. Head to www.susansheridan.com to find out more about Susan. I personally believe she deserves more recognition for her wonderful talent. To me, Mrs. Sheridan is a national treasure of British voice acting. Now, I'd also like to apologise for a technical hiccup that I may have caused during this recording. You see, you may have heard Susan's voice out of sync in the background. This is because I had my headphones on quite loud. I can promise that this will not happen again for future interviews, and I am sorry to those who found this to be a nuisance during the interview. Please head to jamboreeky.com to check out anything else that I have produced.